Good afternoon, everyone. We're probably going to have to abandon 60% of all global oil, coal, and natural gas to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, taking 3% per year offline while the economy would follow. But wait, that was a bait and switch because it was always a 2 degrees Celsius threshold. Why did they lower it to 1.5 C? And you're living it right now. It's already in play. Cheap and reliable sea transport is no longer. The squeeze has begun. The great supply chain disruption. And if you're going to play out what the great reset wants to happen, four tons, three tons, two tons, and you'll be living like a surf within a few years. They're moving to personal carbon allowances that are going to be intertwined with your credit card when you overstep your purchase of your carbon allotment allowance. Thanks, Dad. You'll be able to purchase carbon credits to then buy the item that you want to purchase. And tracking carbon emissions, look at those two feet. Oh, the meme is exceptional. Fictitiously deciding what your allotment of carbon credits are going to be to purchase things in your life. Obey, surf. Apple has just announced a controversial new security update. The tech giant stated they will scan every iPhone, iPad, Apple computer connected to iCloud for illicit materials. Many calling it a disaster in the making. Nearly 100 policy and rights groups asked Apple not to go through with the update. But Apple isn't the only company doing this. Most tech giants breach your privacy in multiple ways. But you can fight back by using a VPN. You can head over to virtualshield.com and in the download tab, I'm going to choose Firefox. And click install now to add the Virtual Shield add-on. It's just that easy. And get started with your free 30-day trial. Install it, click connect. You'll see the shield turn from red to green. And you'll see how from my initial service provider, I was able to even change my IP Virtual Shield network protected. Go to virtualshield.com forward slash adapt 2030 for 50% off today or click the link in the description box below the video. And now on with the video. And right off e and &E News, I saw this one over on Mark Morano's site. The majority of the planet's fossil fuel reserves must stay in the ground if the world wants to even half a chance, literally half a chance, truly literally this time over the climate things we said over the last 30 years that didn't really pan out like the polar bears and the sea ice and the Arctic sea ice and the Antarctic sea ice, etc. Really, literally this time, truly, the, really, you got to believe it this time, the literally. This is the most ambitious climate target ever. That's an AH at the end of that. So I'm looking at this saying, no, 60% of global energy reserves need to remain locked up. What's that going to do to the global economy and everybody's way of life? I don't care what country you live in. A step down in energy resources brings us back to burning wood to cook our food. And that would include delivery of medicines, delivery of food, and everything else that you would consider that keeps your life somewhat secure, even in the times we're in right now. So somebody paying for the study, it's just the study, which will be pegged on across all news media outlets. The study. You have to believe this one. Canada, for example, has to keep 83% of its extractable oil in the ground, compared with about 38% of Russian reserves need to stay in the ground. And the United States suggests that 31% of the oil can't use it. 52% of the natural gas, which burns incredibly clean. I think water vapor is the emission out of that. And 97% of the coal must stay in the ground. So that means we need to go to nuclear. Oh, you can't drive a machine to even mine the ore. So where does that leave you? If you're not going to be able to use a factory to even smelt steel to create a wind turbine, then I think this whole feedback loop is just an exercise in unachievable disaster. Altogether, oil and gas production must decline about 3% each year through 2050. So that means that every year, this Great Reset plan is to reduce the amount of available energy 3% and then increase the prices exponentially so there's demand destruction. 
And if you wade through a bunch of climate jargon, you'll come up with some of these diagrams and numbers. From 2015, global emissions were 4.6 tons on average per person across the planet. But on average, as we move through the entire planet. So as it goes, the world CO2 emissions per capita need to decrease. And you'll see the decreasing line here. And I find it incredibly interesting that right at that curve and that turnover in 2020, the Great Reset's here, and magically, we are being forced to reduce emissions. Lockdowns, you're only allowed out of your house one day a week. Note, very little travel going on, very few airlines, and consumption down almost everywhere. So many mom and pop stores out of business. It seems like they've hit that 3% reduction already, so... If that much damage is needed for a 3% or 6% reduction, what's coming in the next couple of years? Because the bait and switch for me was 1.5C reduction. Oh, climate madness. What about the 2C reductions that were forecast? That was the stated goal 2009. 2C, 2C, got to bring it down 2C, and now it's 1.5. And everywhere you looked across, I dove into a few prior reports Without mitigation, 2C will be crossed. Well, you see the same headline. Without mitigation, 1.5C will be crossed. And you can go back in time, and it's all the way until 2017 when suddenly it flipped to 1.5C. Now, I'm curious why that number was chosen versus 2C, which has been running for 15 years, and suddenly we're down to 1.5C. The stabilization of 450 parts per million. But wait, the lockdowns so far have reduced CO2. So let's continue on some peer-reviewed research here on nature. This is from 2017. Again, the long-term goal of this climate change is reducing your access to goods and economic activity, make you consume less. If you can't do it by coercion, they're going to do it by force. Now, reading into the article, these sustainable development goals are going to be an equitable transition to net zero society. Okay, net zero is impossible. It's absolutely impossible. That means if you burn one stalk of a wheat stalk that you grew and harvested yourself, that one stalk is considered CO2 emission. So I guess the authors are implying by 2050 that everything is going to be made to last. There'll be no planned obsolescence because the windmills and solar panels for this movement to a new uh, energy production system will never, ever break. Ever, because you repair one, you even make a screw to repair that, that's not a net zero society. So how can they claim both in the same paragraph is beyond me, but I do understand how it's going to move to personal carbon allowances. These are going to play a role in achieving the ambitious climate mitigation targets, meaning your life's going to decrease in comfort. Unless you get more self-sufficient and you can ride through these changes at least for a little while longer until we can take our world back. And I find it quite interesting how these personal carbon allowances have been mixed in with the crisis we are in the midst of. Because they call it a low carbon recovery. So this sort of seems like it was baked into the cake moving forward with the sustainable development goals. And we've all just been taken for a ride. And if you look on the left in the purple circle, individuals, that's you and I, below allocation, above allocation. So what does that mean in English? You as an individual, if you want to purchase something in the store that's above the carbon credit issuance that you were given, like your allowance, for example, if you exceed that, you will not be able to purchase the item. Now, MasterCard is in talks right now with the United Nations to implement this. So then what you're going to have to do while sitting in the store is then go off to a private carbon credit provider and then buy that carbon credit on the open market and then add it to your account so you can get more carbon allocation so you can continue with your purchase. Now see this whole carbon credit thing has been made out of thin air like central banking was. Interest on money from thin air. Printed out of nothing yet debt owed. Carbon credit market is exactly the same. It's being created out of absolutely nothing, given value. And I love how you got the primary suppliers and importers of said carbon credits. The direction they're moving it is all based on the carbon footprint. And I said, ooh, one foot. How about two feet? Wow. They were thinking ahead of me on the memes. You couldn't have just one. What I like on the left, though, is the total emissions... 
But then if you look on the right, it's by percentage by a person. So China absolutely disappears into this tiniest, tiniest circle. You can't even see them because they have, you know, 1.8 billion people and the amount of emissions divided by the amount of tons. And then you can't even barely find China in the smallest of circles there. But then you come into somewhere like the Virgin Islands and there's very few people in the emissions. So how does the Virgin Islands take over the China spot? That's hilarious how that's happening. I can do anything with numbers, too. Now, how do you know this is in play already? Well, you already saw what happened in 2020, and three weeks turned into how many years now, and it's continuing. It's going to strengthen. Winter's coming up in the Northern Hemisphere. And we look at the great supply chain disruption. And I love the headline. The world is short of everything. Get used to it. And that is the plan. It is permanent. And it's going to constrict, and there's going to be less and less stuff, and it's not going back to anywhere remotely what you used to remember of the supply chains functioning to bring you this variety that you used to grow up with. And the painful lesson of how interconnected economies are across vast distances. And vast distances mean for me energy use to bring good from far away to a near place all revolving around cheap and reliable sea transport. But as we talked about earlier in the video, the amount of energy allotted to each person, each company, is decreasing 3% per year. So there will be no more inexpensive sea transport. And you see freight rates are up as much tenfold since the beginning of the year. So it really looks like that either 3% or 6%, however you want to divide it. Now, did it start in... 2019, where there's a reduction of 3%, or is it straight up 2020? They took that 3% of energy allocation and resource off the table, and now we're into the 6% by the end of the year. And then 2022, they're going to reduce another 3%. So I'm saying, looking out at the wider landscape with the destruction that has occurred of either a 3 or 6% reduction in energy allotted to the world to use in terms of fossil fuels, If that much damage was done, and I'll give it the full 6%, and we're going into another 3% next year, and 2023 is another 3%, either the world wakes up or you're living in a grass hut, but you're not going to be able to use wood to cook because that'll be an emission and they need to go to a net zero society. So what does that mean? You don't eat, which is an absolutely perfect reason to get emergency food supplies. A three-month supply, Adapt 2030 and My Patriot Supply, also available six-month and one-year food supply packages, 25-year shelf life. That link's in the description box below. Great way to give yourself the peace of mind knowing you have storable foods. If there are emergencies and you're unable to leave or you just want to wait out the chaos, that link's in the description box below along with the links to tonight's stories and images. Hope you got something out of the video. Are you ready to take a carbon hit? I'm not. I'll see you next time.